Is this really what happened to the dinosaurs at Hell Creek, Montana? Were they really spun down in the centrifuge? How much of this should we believe? Hi folks, this is Mark Armitage coming to you from my electron microscope lab. Uh, here you see my transmission electron microscope behind me. Uh, it's not operating right now and that's why this room is fairly quiet. Uh, but as you know I discovered uh, soft stretchy fiber or bone tissues in a triceratops horn from uh, Hell Creek Formation, the same dig that many of the famous paleontologists have dug at. In fact uh, Mary Schweitzer is one, that's where she found her T-Rex femur which we're going to talk about. And a uh, couple of things before we get started. Uh, there are no comments uh, on this video. I think the uh, evolutionists and the long earth agers have done enough commenting on some of my other videos. And so uh, this is going to be uh, short and sweet. Uh, uh, it's going to be a series of three videos that are going to discuss the supposed iron preservation of tissues from the Hell Creek Formation and possibly from other formations all around the world. There are two important papers that we will refer to in this video. The first, 2005, uh, Schweitzer et al. paper in Science, discusses the discovery of the Tyrannosaurus rex femur and the soft tissues within. The second one is the paper by Schweitzer et al. from 2013, which discusses a possible role for iron and oxygen in preserving the soft tissues. Uh, people have been asking me for months uh, to answer the, uh, the supposed solution to uh, long-term preservation of dinosaur tissues, uh, most, uh, most namely the uh, Dr. Mary Schweitzer et al. paper uh, from 2013, which supposedly provides this answer, this solution to why these tissues have persisted uh, for 68, 70 million years. And so, um, so here we go. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do this in three or four parts, and uh, we're gonna break down her paper. We're gonna break down uh, a lot of information about blood behavior, about iron behavior, and so hopefully this will give you a response that you can use uh, when you're discussing soft tissues and dinosaur remains uh, with your friends. Uh, let me say at the start here that uh, uh, the level of viciousness, uh, name calling and uh, otherwise uh, vitriolic comments that have been leveled at me uh, uh, because of the videos that I've put on this YouTube channel are in my opinion unprecedented. Uh, I think that uh, uh, people are really irate, really upset with me personally. They try to demonize me, call me names, uh, they call me you know, uh, an arrogant idiot, all, all kinds of things. And so I think it's unprecedented and I, I believe we've hit a nerve. Folks, I believe with the soft tissue and dinosaur bones, we have hit a nerve, uh, particularly with the old earth, uh, long age, uh, people committed to millions and millions of years, uh, because the average person on the street reacts viscerally to this. People get it. When you tell people there's soft tissue and dinosaur bones, soft, stretchy, fibrillar tissues, and some of the beautiful soft cells that I've shown many, many pictures of, uh, people react instantly to that and they they get it they realize that's got to be young I mean there's virtually no explanation necessary and so by soft fibrillar stretchy tissues I mean these tissues that came out of the very center of the horn bone look at how this is like a piece of taffy I can stretch it in both axes and it is so resilient it just bounces back to its original conformation so how can this be 68, 70 plus million years and still retain this kind of elasticity? Number one. Number two, I thin section these things and they're chock full of osteocytes, the little cells that populate bone. And so how can these have these kind of structures in them and be that old? And so here are some of these osteocytes. You can see they're beautiful cells and they have these little thread feet that come off, these little philopodia that are still completely intact and they're nanometers in size. So how can this kind of preservation be there on cells that are 65, 68, 70 million years old? It's impossible. 
Dr. Schweitzer et al. Uh, in her series of papers on soft tissues and dinosaur bone uh, uh, nailed the identification of these tissues. She killed it uh, because she showed uh, without any doubt that these are original proteins, original tissues that go back to the original dinosaur and so, uh, so that, that settled it. That settled the fact that these are original tissues in these dinosaur remains and, uh, and so that left the evolutionists scrambling uh, for a, 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 you know, an answer uh, for how, how these are here. What, what is a credible answer that they can offer uh, for the preservation of these tissues because we know these tissues don't last a long time. Uh, and so they're looking for a materialistic explanation. That means an explanation that, that's rooted in science, observable scientific fact, because they are completely committed to millions of years. They will never let go of millions of years. And of course, without millions of years, you can't evolve anything. And so uh, I believe that that's why soft tissue is such a lightning rod because it just erases millions of years. I mean, it just erases it off the whiteboard. And so they're committed to that and, and they're committed to finding a materialistic explanation. Now let me say at the outset here, I'm not committed to 6,000 years. And that may, may sound strange coming from a young earth creationist, but I'm not committed to 6,000 years and here's why. Uh, Schweitzer et al. Uh, have found original proteins, as I mentioned, that go back to the, the original dinosaur. And they've, they've emphasized that these proteins have an outside uh, age of uh, one million years. So they've, they've, in their writings, they've acknowledged that these proteins, such as collagen, actin, tubulin, histones, I mean, we know they're there, uh, that their work it has been fabulous, it's been sound, good scientific work that shows that these proteins are there and they themselves admit that they have an outside age of a million years. And so, uh, as a young earth creationist, I would not even have a problem accepting a million years for, uh, for the beginning of creation because you still can't evolve these organisms in a million years. You need millions and millions of years to evolve these organisms. And so, so even if we go out a million years, we're still okay. Uh, I don't need an explanation. They need an explanation for how these proteins have survived more than a million years. I don't need an explanation because I know, uh, based on all the other evidence that supports the young earth, that the creator is real, that he made these things, and that Genesis is believable. So, so they found these proteins, and, uh, and now they're trying to explain their preservation, fabulous preservation, based on this iron preservation uh, uh, hypothesis that they made. And, and it's a little embarrassing. I consider this experiment uh, that was done uh, with the blood, soaking tissues in blood, really a 10th grade science experiment. I mean, they used chicken blood, they used ostrich blood to prove uh, that, uh, that these soft tissues in dinosaur bone have been preserved. That's what everybody's saying. Everybody's saying they proved it with the iron uh, hypothesis. Now, now we're going to discuss what the paper really says. The paper doesn't claim to prove anything. The play paper claims that there is a role for iron and oxygen in the preservation of tissues, not that they themselves have preserved the tissues. And we're going to we're going to drill down into this. We've struck a nerve we're going to drill down, we're going to do a root canal uh, on this nerve that we've touched and see if we can help these evolutionists out with the truth about what has really been found. Now another important thing that you need to know is that these dinosaur remains, these bones, are not fossils. Okay, they're not fossils, they are bones. They're still bones. And how do I know that? Because they react to conventional bone processing. They react to the same uh, uh, dissolution of bone mineral uh, that, that hospital laboratories perform all over the country today using EDTA to dissolve bone mineral to have access to the soft tissues that are in those bones that's used every day all around the planet. And so these dinosaur remains are responding to that which means they're still bones. They have not been fossilized which is astounding 
because, because the bone mineral has been sitting there in the dirt, in the water, in, in, in all uh, the, the things that are found in the environment, and yet they were never replaced. Their bone minerals were never replaced with the hard stone minerals that we've been told are uh, actually what fossils are made of. So these are not fossils, folks. They're real bones. They're, they're, they're tissues just like your bones are. If they were old, if they were 65 million years old, they'd be hard rock. You see, they'd be hard rock, and they're not. They are actual bone mineral that respond to uh, the treatment that we put them in. Now, next, I, I want to reiterate that Dr. Schweitzer et al., their paper, 2013 paper, uh, is titled, A Role for Iron and Oxygen in Tissue Preservation. Not, here folks, we have now found the smoking gun, the evidence that proves that these tissues uh, are here because of iron and oxygen. No, they're simply saying there's a role for these things in iron preservation. And they might, there might be. There might be a role for rust, which is what iron and oxygen is. Fe2O3 is rust. And there might be a role, but I don't think, I don't think it's a, as significant a role as they've made out in the paper, and we'll talk about that. Fe2O3, we'll talk about the chemistry of that, uh, how these iron particles behave, and, and excuse me, and so we will go into all this in detail as we proceed. Let's continue with our discussion here and let's talk about blood behavior uh, because forensic pathologists have uh, had a lot of years to study the behavior of blood uh, in a dead body or in a limb, a severed limb. Bill Bass and others have spent close to 50 years uh, studying the decomposition of bodies in the body farm and in Death's Acre. So this information is well established and well known among scientists. There is an established science here in forensics uh, that can predictably say what the blood, how the blood is going to behave in a dead body or a severed limb. This is predictable. Now blood clots readily uh, upon contact with ripped or torn uh, skin, ripped veins, ripped arteries, ripped skin, that releases proteins that tells the blood, hey, I've got an opening here and you need to stop it. And so this, this elegant blood clotting cascade begins immediately upon blood touching ripped or severed skin. Uh, so we know that blood will clot readily and, and more importantly, uh, if there's a dead body and there is an opening where, where the blood is, is, is leaking out, where the body is bleeding out, a lot of that blood will clot. Some of it will pool and decompose, but a lot of it will clot. So clotting is very important. There are a lot of clotting factors in blood. There are a lot of clotting proteins in the serum of blood. And there are also uh, cells, there are platelets in the blood that uh, per perform an important function during clotting. And there are also tissue factors in torn tissue that tell the blood, okay, it's time to clot. So clotting is the first hurdle that has to be overcome here. Now, now when you consider uh, a severed limb uh, or even a, even a deep gash into a large uh, artery in the body, the, the, the heart will keep pumping. And so the heart alone can bleed out a body in a matter of minutes, uh, maybe in a half an hour, uh, a, a body can be bled out completely if there's a big enough gash because the pumping action of the heart uh, continues for a while but then eventually it stops and uh, once the heart action stops or let's say in the case of a liver, severed limb there's no heart action because the limb has been severed from the body and so the limb is bleeding out and so the blood uh, will drain it will drain from the arteries into the veins and this is, this is an established science forensics has established this and so the blood will drain uh, first it'll bleed out, then it'll, whatever's left will drain into the arteries, uh, drain, I'm sorry, drain from the arteries into the veins, and, and then it begins to pool. It pools in the veins. And, and we also know conclusively that blood will pool at the lowest part of the limb or the body. 
because of gravity. It'll pool into that lowest part of the body and then it will proceed to decompose from there. Now Dr. Schweitzer and her team described the T-Rex femur that they found as a disarticulated element. Now a lot of people don't know what that means, a disarticulated element. That means it was completely separated uh, from the joint uh, and possibly from the body. So here we now have a T-Rex limb that was maybe ripped away from the body probably by the action of the flood waters on it and so it's a disarticulated limb uh, and this is in the 2005 paper and we'll show you a picture of that. Therefore as a disarticulated element this T-Rex limb bone may have been completely ripped away from the body it's hard to tell. And so, so this limb uh, has been severed. Uh, she also described it as crushed and deformed. She says some of the bones that she discovered there were crushed and deformed. We'll show you a picture of that. This is from the 2005 paper. You can see it says deformed or crushed. And so, so she is describing the conditions of how this T. rex femur came to be in the Hell Creek Formation probably ripped away from the body, disarticulated element, laying separate uh, in the sand or in the dirt, probably bled out completely, uh, or whatever was left in there, probably pooled. It went from the arteries to the veins, went to the bottom part of the limb, and pooled. And that's where it, it decomposed and released probably these iron filaments that she talks about having preserved the tissues. Now one thing that's very important to understand with regard to the 2005 paper by Dr. Schweitzer and her team and the 2013 paper by Dr. Schweitzer and her team is that the materials and methods section is not a part of the paper. At the beginning and at the end of her list of references you can see that the materials and methods section which was not a part of the paper is available elsewhere if you have the ability to log on through science and get the paper for free or if you pay for it. Now this is unusual. Uh, most papers include a materials and methods section to show you how the experiment was actually performed, what was done, what, uh, what reagents were used, what chemicals were used, uh, what equipment was used in the study of whatever it was the paper was about. And so the materials and methods section is completely missing it is available, you can go to Science Online and we'll show you a reference that shows this in the paper. Again, here's the website that you can log on to to get this information. And so there's the reference that tells you you have to go online and, uh, and purchase it or download it if you're already a member of Science or whatever the journal is, and you can download it. And so it's not available to the wide public. It's, it's only available to those who have the capability to go online and download it. Same thing with the 2013 paper. The materials and methods section was completely absent from the paper. And that's important because uh, that's what we're going to look at. Now I've, got, I've gotten a lot of responses, a lot of comments from evolutionists who basically copy and paste portions of these papers into their response to me. You know, that's not doing your homework, folks. Copying and pasting parts from scientific papers as your response to what I'm saying, what I'm saying specifically and scientifically about these things is no response at all. So, so avoid the, uh, the embarrassment that you're going to face if you continue to do that. Now, if you want to add constructively to the scientific conversation, and you want to analyze what's in the materials and methods, what's in the paper, and discuss those things, we can have a discussion. But if all you're going to do is copy and paste out of a paper and, give, and present that to me as your qualified response to what I'm saying, you know, bye-bye. We're done. And, uh, and so if you want to be part of the discussion, uh, do your homework and be part of the discussion. Now I want to point out one other thing that's very important that most people I think do not realize because they haven't studied the paper, they haven't done their homework, and, and here I'm referring to the 20, uh, 2005 paper in the journal Science 
about the T-Rex femur, and then of course the follow-on uh, 2013 paper about the role for iron and oxygen in the preservation of soft tissues. Uh, Dr. Schweitzer and her team used the exact same specimen from the 2005 paper to do the work in the 2013 paper. Now this raises a lot of questions. Uh, for eight years, this specimen now is out of the ground, where it has been for supposedly 65, 68 million years. What are the conditions outside of the ground versus inside the ground, and how might that impact this specimen? How was it handled? How was it stored? Uh, what was the chain of custody? Uh, who had control over these specimens that were now eight years out of the ground and obviously being changed by uh, the atmosphere that it had access to, by humidity, uh, by the reagents that it was in, by the, the vessels that it was contained in, by whatever wrapping or storing uh, it was in, and, and, and the temperature. Uh, you know, uh, Hell Creek, Montana is, uh, is wide open to all the environmental factors that we like to uh, sequester ourselves from. We build nice houses, comfortable and warm and heated uh, in the winter and air-conditioned in the summer. And so here now, we have an eight-year-old an eight year old bone, a bone eight years now out of the ground, what, in an air-conditioned laboratory? What conditions there may have modified or changed this specimen uh, before it was used for the 2013 paper? Now also, when you look at the figures, uh, and I'll reference figure C and figure E, and we'll show you those in a second, uh, in, the, in the iron paper, the 2013 paper. Here's figure C from the T-Rex iron paper, and you can see a box which is enclosing an image which is going to be magnified for better viewing. Here it is now magnified for better viewing, and you can see the iron layer is highly encapsulated on one area of the vessel. Iron is highly localized. The iron filaments, the iron particles, are highly localized into one big mass and all you have to do is flip over uh, the image and, and it looks like blood pooling at one point in the vessel. Here I've flipped the picture upside down and you can actually see where the iron and blood must have pooled at the bottom after death. And so it's not hard for me to envision blood pooling in that part of the vessel and having these iron filaments highly localized there. Uh, now the caption there says that the iron particles are infiltrating uh, an organic layer. And so here the paper is saying that the iron layer is infiltrating into an organic layer. I don't see it as infiltrating. I see it as pooled together. Now if those iron particles were infiltrating the organic layer, why are they not, why are they so compacted and highly localized? Why aren't they moving out, you know, in different directions? They would all not move at the same speed because they'd be going through different membranes uh, and different resistances. So why are they all encapsulated like they would be if the blood pooled at the bottom of the vessel like forensic science has taught us? And if they are infiltrating, as Dr. Schweitzer and others say, why, why are they all encapsulated? Why are they not moving uh, in, in different sections, different rates, so we'd see some iron filaments in different places. No, we see them all encapsulated. So um, I don't understand how that mass of iron filaments demonstrates infiltration. I don't understand that because I understand infiltration. I use fixatives all the time to fix tissues and, and I don't understand how that mass shows infiltration. Now, the iron particles are also supposed to behave like formaldehyde. This is what the paper asserts. Uh, the formaldehyde, we call it formalin, is a fixative that we use to cross-link all the proteins. And so uh, we're talking about maybe 100 nanometer sized iron particles that are, are, that are shaped in, uh, in geometric shapes because remember they're crystalline, they're iron, they're metal, so they've crystallized into these uh, geometric shapes. And now the, they're supposed to behave the same as a 7 angstrom. Remember. 100 nanometer sized iron particle is supposed to behave like a 7 angstrom sized molecule uh, of formalin 
to perform this miracle of, uh, of fixation that is talked about in the paper. Now we're going to discuss that more in depth uh, as we go on. One other thing to note is that you have that, that pool of iron uh, filaments or uh, particles and then you have this amorphous layer. It's called an amorphous layer in the paper. It has lots of structure in it. Man, I look at this amorphous layer and it has all kinds of structure in it. I see membranes and maybe vacuoles and other maybe organelles and things. So it looks anything but amorphous to me. And I showed that picture uh, at the microscopy and microanalysis meeting in Hartford last summer and everybody agreed with me. It has <clears throat> a lot of structure and there are no iron particles uh, anywhere near it. And so can iron particles reach across uh, huge swaths of tissue and do preservation even though they're not in intimate contact with these tissues that I see a lot of structure in? I don't think so. So we'll talk about that more later on but just a couple more things before we end this session. In part three of this series we're going to talk about uh, Dr. Schweitzer's experimental methods. Uh, and I think there's a lot to talk about because I went and found the materials and methods section. And as you can see, the materials and methods section is not a part of the paper. It's part of the supplementary electronic material that you have to go search for. And we're going to discuss what her methods, all the methods that she used. But I just want to say a couple of things before we end this segment. Number one, <clears throat> an anticoagulant was used at the beginning of the experiment with the chicken and the ostrich blood. Now let me repeat that. An anticoagulant was put into the chicken and the ostrich blood before the experiment began. Why? Why was an anticoagulant used? You know, I can't picture an anticoagulant being present in the sands of the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. <clears throat> so why was that used? Well, we're going to discuss that and we're going to show you why it had to be used in order for the experiment to continue. Number two, in the, material, in the methods of this experiment, centrifuges were used. High speed centrifuges which spin down uh, things in the blood that you want to spin down. Why? Why were centrifuges used on this blood before the experiment began? Now we're going to talk about that. I'm going to show you that there are, there are significant reasons why centrifuges had to be used. But I can't picture any centrifuges at Hell Creek Formation spinning down the blood of dinosaurs so that their tissues can be preserved. So we'll talk about that. The third item I just want to mention in passing is that molecular filters were used. Filters that actually uh, filter out molecules, I and mean, that's how small these filters are, to, uh, to concentrate molecules. That was done before the experiment on the tissue began. Why? Why were molecular filters used? And on and on and on it goes. So we're going to spend in section three, we're in section one now, in section three of this discussion we will talk about the methods that were used in this experiment. Is there a role for iron and oxygen in the preservation of tissue? I don't think so. And I think we're going to discover that as we go through this. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your support. We appreciate you guys very much.